Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 159th video cast, 149th podcast for the week ending November 3rd, 2022. I'll kick it off with the media spots. Want to thank Taylor Clothier, Sydney Freed, uh, Shauna Smith, Dave Briggs, and Rochelle Akufo for having me on Yahoo Finance yesterday to discuss the Fed presser in real time. Also, want to thank Pamela Barbaglia and Schumann Daga, Andres Gonzalez, Megan Davies for including me in their article on Reuters last week. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, this was Halloween this week. Here are the girls going out to trick or treat on Monday. There's little Annabelle and there is Mimi. Uh, I think they changed costumes because she, when we went to the club, she had all this face makeup with blood all over. It was like a prom queen and uh, Annabelle was the Grim Reaper at the club. She looks like she changed into something a little sweeter for uh, the actual Halloween day. Uh, this was Caitlin and me at the club. Uh, as always, you know, one of the, uh, the staff asked me, what are you going to be for Halloween this year? I said, do you remember what I was last year? They said, no. I said, that's what I'm going to be this year. So I went with the, uh, John Dutton Yellowstone, uh, new, new, uh, uh, season of Yellowstone's coming out. Uh, and that worked just fine. Quote of the week. I, I like this one from Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, from time to time, I get invited to a shooting club uh, around here that he founded. And um, uh, Michael Dell put this out with regard to Elon Musk. Uh, he said, win or lose, respect to Elon Musk for being the man in the arena. The man in the arena. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, uh, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat." Uh, this resonated, you know, this has been a, a, a bit of a, a choppy year to, to put it mildly. Uh, and I think we'll have some, some really amazing resolution, uh, if not toward the end of the year, certainly in 2023. Uh, and, uh, and this is what it's all about. And, and most people never do anything significant because they always quit when the going gets tough. Uh, but as we know, the ending of that is the tough get going. And, um, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about here. And just stick to the facts of uh, what we're doing, what we own, how we think about it, and how that value is sooner or later realized. Uh, and as we um, uh, tribute to Seth Klarman, it turns out that value investing is something that's in your blood. There are people who just don't have the patience or discipline to do it, and there are people who do. So it leads me to think it's genetic. And the longer I'm around, the more I realize this is true. Uh, you know, the difference between people who stick with quality ideas and see them through and make multi-baggers and the ones who quit at the first signs of uh, tumult uh, and never go on to make anything as they chase every single trend and wind up being top tickers uh, till the day they die. So um, here's some quotes from J.P. Morgan Mislav. Uh, they believe disinflation phase has already begun and that inflation prints both headline and core will be meaningfully lower three, three to six months time. We know all this. I referenced this in the Yahoo Finance uh, interview in that I said, you know, the Fed can't come out and say, we predict CPI is going to be down three to six months from now. Therefore, we're going to uh, stop hiking. Uh, they really do need something to hang their hat on. And I think it's going to be coming sooner than later. Uh, but this is the data that they're talking about. Uh, earlier rollover in commodities, goods inflation is now softening. Uh, corporate intentions to raise prices have peaked and rolled over, you can see in the chart. And the intentions to increase wages also appear to have peaked. So this shows the labor market is softening. So it won't be long till the Fed can hang their hat on something. I don't think it will be in this week's jobs report. Although continuing claims were elevated today, the jolts uh, were pretty high on, on Tuesday. Um, but we've got two inflation prints and multiple... Um, less important than CPI prints between now and December. 
Uh, they did leave the downshift to 50 basis points on the table for December. He said, if not December, then the, then the following meeting, for, basically for sure. Uh, so that will be what people are looking for in terms of a pivot, i.e. a downshift coming down from 75 to 50, then maybe 25. And whether the terminal rate's 4.6 or 5 at this point, it's meaningless because they're going to figure out abruptly at some point in 2023 that they tighten too much. And we'll have to reverse course pretty quickly as they do every single time. Um, this, see if I can shrink it so you can see it here, is um, my friend Rick sent it over. M2 money supply growth versus inflation. I sent out the Mike Wilson on a chart on this where he showed M2 money supply uh, staggered by 16 months and how it was rolling over. But you can see every single time that this black line, which is the M2 growth rate, um, uh, got down to towards uh, single digits here, inflation was already rolling over. Inflation is always a monetary phenomenon in the great words of Milton Friedman. Uh, and this time will be no different. Uh, you see here it got towards the single digits and inflation was just peaking and then it rolled over every single time single digits inflation rolling over single digits um let's see here single digits and then inflation followed to roll over and now we're back at single digits and it looks like inflation is rolling over so it's just patience and time you wanted it to be two months ago and said it's going to be two months later uh but at the end of the day you just stay put and that's why by the way the most important thing that buffett ever taught uh, and that I learned very early on my in my career, the 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 three killers, ladies, liquor, and leverage, uh, with probably leverage being the most most uh, critical. Uh, if you don't have leverage on, all you have to do is deal with a short term unrealized loss. It, it makes absolutely no difference if you know what you own uh, until you ride through that, and then you wind up with you know your multi baggers over time based on knowing the intrinsic value, then the market comes around, then the market gets euphoria, euphoria, then you get multiple expansion, then everyone wants it. Kind of like what's happening with energy right now. No one wanted it in 2020, now everyone wants it, uh, except for the fact that uh, this year it had the highest earnings growth, next year it's expected to have the lowest earnings growth, and of course everyone's chasing it now. Uh, not to say it won't go higher over the next three to five years, but um, I think most of the juice is out of that in the short term. Uh, and all you need is some type of announcement from Ukraine or that, uh, and and that game is over quickly. And given the amount of excitement around it, I would say that's probably sooner rather than later. Um, also from RBC, S&P and percentage of stocks greater than the 200-day and 50-day moving averages. Uh, I like this 200 days. You can see it rarely gets down as low as it got uh, recently. Um, the previous times were 2002, generational buy opportunity. Then 2009, generational buy opportunity. Then 2015 and 16, which this most resembles generational uh, buy opportunity for the next few years. Uh, and then right now, we're in the exact same situation. So it's something to keep an eye on. Ryan Dietrich, I love this. Uh, he reposted something from JP Morgan that shows stocks usually bottom before EPS, before earnings. So everyone looking for earnings to come down more. Number one, uh, they've been calling for 20% reduction in estimates uh, for the last six months. We've gotten barely 6% uh, uh, as of right now. But as you can see from these, um, stocks bottom before EPS, jobs, GDP start to improve. Time after time we've seen it, but no, it didn't work during tech bubble. Bottom line is stocks sniff out better times and rally in the face of bad news. So I want to just show you this because for everyone looking for this huge rollover in earnings, look at this right here, 1957. So earnings were coming down just a, barely a bit when the stock market had already bottomed. Um, by the time earnings actually collapsed and did go down, in this case, 16%, um, Uh, well, actually, I don't know what this is measuring on the left side, but they what, you can see the red line here, earnings collapsed. Um, the S&P had already almost recovered all of its losses by the time earnings bottomed. So the mistake people think is that the multiple is too high or the multiple is not low. Markets always bottom with a super high earnings multiple because earnings have come down and stocks are starting to recover ahead of anticipating 
the recovery of stocks. And it's the same every time. Here's the bottom. Here's the peak in earnings. Earnings collapsed. The market had already recovered most of its losses. Here's the bottom. Uh, earnings started to come down, but they by the time earnings bottom, the market was already well beyond where it had been before. That's the 82. That's the uh, inflation scenario that I showed you last week. Uh, 91 earnings had here. They were actually going back up when the market bottomed. By the time the market bottomed, the market was at new highs uh, by the time earnings bottom. And here earnings, this the exception. This was the only, uh, no, this is not the exception. So here the market bottom earnings bottomed um, about four months later and the market was already up some 70%. And then finally, uh, the market bottomed here, uh, looks like about eight or nine months before earnings bottomed and the market was already back to new highs. So this is a really useful thing for everyone waiting for earnings to collapse. Uh, you could do that except for the fact that the market may be at new highs uh, because it will have already been discounting. Just like the market's down, like the Nasdaq's down 30% discounting a recession, it's already priced in. Uh, by the time those recession earnings trough actually show up, if they do, the market may already be at new highs anticipating the recovery. So that's the way the market works. It's a discounting mechanism, um, as most of my long-term listeners know. Uh, this is a key factor. The election's coming up next week, in my view, and I noted it in the article of the week, is that the number one issue is the economy. It's not the secondary issues that everyone thinks it's about in which case the 70% odds that the Republicans sweep the House and the Senate are uh, probably accurate. Uh, and if that's the case, um, number one, it's gridlock. I, I really don't care if they have one or both houses, to be honest with you, uh, or if it was a Republican president and Democratic House and Senate. The key is that you have gridlock, and the market likes that. The average S&P returns following a midterm election, regardless of the outcome, are 18.6%. Uh, but the key thing this time is that the if the Republicans get both houses, they are going to stop all fiscal spending, number one. And number two, they are going to challenge the uh, Inflation inflation Reduction Act and the Build Back Better um, uh, bill. N not that they'll necessarily be successful, but they'll do everything they can to slow down the spending. And when... Uh, the Fed realizes that I think they're going to come to the conclusion that they've already over tightened if if that outcome happens on November 8th. And I think the market's going to start to sniff that out in the next seven days, uh, five days before the election and then digest the results afterwards. Uh, and the uh, terminal rate is going to look a lot different uh, in two weeks than it looks today. So keep that in mind. And that could be a, a next catalyst. Um more stuff from Bank of America, the bull and bear indicator. We know this. It's still at extreme bearishness. Uh, Long-term returns for U.S. Treasuries at 50-year lows. We know there's probably a huge opportunity to be buying the long end of the curve here in the near term. Worst year for 10-year Treasury since 1788. Uh, I like that contrarian bet. Uh, policy hikes in 2022. Okay, so we got that. Moving along, this is really interesting. This is... CEO business confidence expectations for the economy. Uh, you don't get uh, expectations this low too often. It's only happened one, two, three, four. Uh, this is the fifth time it's happened since 1985, so 37 years. Um, and each time that uh, CEO business confidence got that low were major, major bottoms. Uh, 91 started the huge uh, nine-year rally. Uh, 2002 and 2003 was the next time. Unbelievable opportunity to buy. 2009 was the next time. 2020 was the next time. And 2022. So this is very, very interesting chart. Uh, you want to pay close attention to that. Um, okay, next. Real estate market cooling rapidly. So we see here the FHFA house price index is collapsing. Uh, that is... Um, uh, going to be reflected in owner's equivalent rent over time, which is a major component of, you know, housing is 41% of CPI. So all this stuff's going to start to be happening. And then the Fed will have something to hang their hat on. And then they'll be able to say after the 50 in December, they'll be able to say, you know, maybe one more 25. We reserve the right to go back up to, you know, 75 or whatever the hell they want to say, but they won't need to, uh, is our view. Um, 
This just shows the central bank balance sheet. They've done a lot of tightening there and the impact that it's had on FANG. Uh, that tightening will probably uh, continue for a little while, but once the inflation prints start to roll off, uh, you're probably going to see a mitigation of the balance sheet reduction, uh, despite the fact no one's talking about that right now. Secular shift points to outperformance of small cap versus large caps. Uh, this just shows the trends of outperformance versus underperformance. So that's interesting. It could go lower, but it's something to keep an eye on. Same thing with value versus growth. We were talking about this in 2020 when it bottomed and we were buying banks and energy. And then uh, this is interesting, a long downward journey ahead for U.S. equity returns. This is how charts can mislead you and leave you out, out of some of the biggest rallies in the history of mankind. So we had the exact same thing, even more pronounced in 1989. It's huge 10-year 10, 10 run-up. You're only halfway through a secular bull and you would have missed 1991 to 1999, which was the biggest returns in the shortest period of time in history. I think we're at the exact same thing here i think we've got another 10 years and we've talked about it because of the millennials 72 million bigger than the baby boomers starting housing formation drives the bus every single uh secular bull market and it's just getting started so i think this could be a fake out chart and the same thing happened in 19 in the mid 1950s you had it up here people would have said that's it for equity returns look how high they are and you missed the entire rally from 53 to 66 you don't get many of those in a lifetime. You missed the entire rally from 91 to 99. And I think the people that are reading this chart incorrectly, like the, the publisher uh, of the chart, are going to miss a, 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 another 10 years of amazing uh, returns. So um, driven by secular demand. So uh, expect lower tech returns in coming years. This, again, is another fake out you had from 1953. You would have missed 1953 to 1966. You would have probably missed, uh, yeah, here in 1993, you would have gotten off the tech bandwagon and missed the, the biggest tech run in history. So you have to be careful how some of these things read. Skew we've covered. This is back to pandemic lows. This basically means the house has already burned down. Uh, the demand for two standard deviation insurance has gone to nil. Uh, this measures the cost of insurance, one in, you know, catastrophe insurance, one and two standard deviations out versus the VIX measures at the money. Uh, and this tells me really what I need to know. This is the time you want to be a buyer versus a seller, uh, not vice versa. Here's the 10 day put call ratio starting to roll over after being extremely elevated in October. Um, this is from Seth Goldman. Uh, for people thinking that we're going to have another 2008, they're mistaken. Periods of rising mortgage rates by and large do not impact home values. Hard to use the C words crisis crash and housing in the same sentence when homeowners still generating wealth. Still no viable way to bridge delta between inventory and demand. And he shows uh, all of the hiking cycles and what the average return for houses were during those periods. So 71 to 74, mortgage rates went from 7 to 10. Housing prices went up 18%. 77 to 80, rates went from 8.7 to 16.3, housing prices went up 50%. 80 to 81, rates went from 12 to 18, houses went up 7, et cetera, et cetera. You can see this, and most recently from 2015 to 2018, rates went from 3.6 to 5, house prices went up 22.4. I could certainly see housing prices being subdued for sure in the low single digits for the next few years, and some areas that went up the most, like 60%, you know, dropping back 20%, but they'll still be up net 40 um, and, uh, I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, some more, you know, more headlines, you just take them with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, it's, it's we're going to cover Cooper standard and, and basically how nothing matters until they get the refinancing. Uh, the China thing we covered last week, nothing matters for Alibaba until the dollar starts to weaken and the dollar starts to weaken when the fed, uh, starts to cut back and goes from emergency hikes of 75 down to 50 then the dollar will you know maybe start to discount it ahead of time when that dollar stops going up china and emerging markets are going to go through the moon it's going to be the trade of the next few years uh and fortunes are going to be made we just don't know when we think it's imminent uh but you know you, you just can't pinpoint these things but anyway in the meantime it's rumored that beijing will soon establish an expert team to put together a conditional reopening plan that's why you saw chinese stocks rallying earlier in the week and i think they're strong today on no news which i like even better um, and also in a week tape, which is especially nice. Uh, the upcoming 10th edition of COVID guideline is widely expected to provide upside surprises. 
uh, heard that reopening committee has formed and led a by Wang Huning, Politburo standing member. The committee is reviewing COVID data from U.S., Hong Kong, and Singapore to assess various reopening scenarios. Target set for March 2023 reopening. We'll see. Um, here's the Fed whisperer, Nick Timoros. Federal Reserve hikes by 75 points, signals slower increases, which would imply 50 for December. Powell, what Powell actually said was, if not December, then the meeting after. But it may be December. They they do need something to hang their hat on in the interim. But ultimately higher rates. So he basically conceded, probably going down to 50 in December, but probably, you know, moving the terminal rate from 4, 6 to 5. So one more 25. But if they get data in the interim, they'll back off. I mean, they just don't have the data now and they can't make the walk back on predictions. So that's where they are because they want to manage expectations. That's their most important job. China State Council reiterates policy support to bolster companies' digital economy as tech war with U.S. intensifies. So they put out an eight-pronged plan, yada, 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 yada. None of this stuff matters until the dollar weekends. China Central Bank reaffirms it will step up support for the real economy, yada, 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 until the dollar weakens. Alipay signs up almost half of Hong Kong population as users of payments app continue cashless journey. So, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, but but uh, no one's attributing any value to Alibaba shareholders owning a third of this. I mean, I was talking to a friend over the weekend and... Um, you know, Alibaba traded down to $98 billion net of cash this weekend, it, it, which is just mind boggling, which is basically the value of Ant Financial, the, the one third ownership in Ant Financial over the next three to five years. So basically the cloud business, which will do probably 10 million of operating income within three years, uh, which is in my view worth, you know, 150, 200 billion. Uh, and the e-commerce business, which is not only growing in China, uh, but also uh, massively in Europe and internationally, you know, the equivalent of Amazon outside of the, the U.S. is worth zero dollars right now. But that makes perfect sense. None of it matters until the dollar weakens. Uh, Chinese tech giants push into the U.S. and Europe's markets set up a potential clash with Amazon. I saw uh, Chinese packages in my mailbox. I was like, what the hell is this? I thought maybe I was getting a bomb sent. Uh, it's my wife was ordering off of something called AliExpress. Um, so that's all I need to know. I mean, uh, you know, maybe she's been listening to the podcast too much and she's trying to, you know, beef up uh, profits, but, uh, no, she's, she just says it's a new thing. So, uh, we'll see. Um, okay. Next is JP Morgan's wealth chief Erodes backs China markets after stock route is best opportunity to emerge when doubters flee. I think a lot of the doubters have fled by now. If, if last month, last week didn't scare them out or two weeks ago, nothing will. Uh, and that's absolutely right. Nothing will. Uh, HKEX chairwoman, China economy sure to rebound. I'll tell you what would scare me out of China. If the dollar depreciated by 15 or 20 percent and stayed there and Chinese stocks didn't move up, uh, that might scare me out of China. Uh, uh, but I, I think it would be virtually impossible to see that scenario play out. So, uh, I'm willing to be tested on that, uh, because by then we'll probably be up one and a half X, uh, hundred, hundred fifty percent. And, uh, and then fundamentals will start to matter again. People start to pay attention to them, start to value it as a business versus, uh, an emotional piece of paper. And, uh, and then we start to work on the multi-bagger. So, uh, Hong Kong chairwoman, uh, China economy sure to rebound as reforms continue and markets digest leadership reshuffle. Um, Morgan Stanley's Wilson says, end of Fed tightening nearing from his lips to God's ears. We've covered that. Uh, Alibaba, JD.com, post healthy pre-sales for singles day, but consumer spending may be slowing. Recorded robust sales during the first round of single day shopping spree. Uh, doesn't matter till the dollar weekends. Jack Ma's 10 cents uh, talent scheme lands in Hong Kong as Ant Group joins hands with the government to train FinTech professionals. That's a positive sign of the times, the fact that he's back in the spotlight and that Ant is working with the government. All good signs. Uh, doesn't matter till the dollar weekends. Tightening has peaked. Yields are in the process of peaking out. Uh, JP Morgan's Kalanovic. So, you know, Wilson and Kalanovic, serious guys. Um... 
from their lips to God's ears, and then everything will fall into place. Dollar will weaken, China will rip, emerging markets will rip, uh, and off to the races. Now's the time to buy bombed out credit markets, says Double Lines Jeffrey Gunlack. When he talks bonds, I listen, I agree with that. And if that's the case, bonds get bid, uh, dollars weakening, everything else plays out. I thought this was interesting. As you look at some of the stocks that have been totally bombed out, the uh, pandemic darlings, uh, maybe too early to buy most of them, but this one did catch my eye. Shopify CEO buys $10 million of stock in the open market. That's kind of interesting. I think the stock's down about 900%, uh, 90%. So um, I've had my eye on that one for a while. I'm not doing anything with it yet, but it's that's kind of interesting. Uh, Stellantis revenue jumps on strong prices, rising deliveries, more um, um, uh, follow on from GM and Ford. Uh, and we saw it in uh, um, Cooper's operating results, uh, generating $20 million of adjusted EBITDA, but until they get the refinancing announcement, none of it matters. So with Alibaba, none of the good fundamentals matter until the dollar weekends with Cooper Standard, none of the good fundamentals matter until the uh, until one day we wake up to a press release that they've refinanced. So, um, okay, so article of the week, double talk stock market and sentiment results. Uh, yesterday, I joined Shauna Smith, Dave Briggs, and Rochelle Akufo in studio at Yahoo Finance. Thanks to Taylor Clothier and Taylor, Sydney Freed for having me on. Because I came out immediately following the Fed's press conference, the interview on the Fed in real t- uh, the interview focused on the Fed in real time. The odd thing about the press release the Fed issued and Powell's press conference was the contradictory nature of both parts. As a matter of fact, there was a video clip circulating today that the reporter from the Associated Press asked a question, you know, Mr. Powell, are you okay with the fact that the markets are acting positively on the basis of your press release? And after that, Powell just shifted tune tenor like immediately and he's just started saying like a pause is out of the question and that's not what we meant and blah 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 so it's it's kind of like he's got this trading range and he, he's selling he's selling calls against the 3900 on the s p and um and um and then buying puts as he just keeps it in this 36 3900 trading range and anytime it gets close to 3900 he has to uh parade out a bunch of people to to hawk talk the markets but nonetheless, um, uh, the thing that I know that I've noticed though is, you know, back when John Hilsenrath was the Fed whisperer at the Wall Street Journal, you could count on whatever he signaled would be consistent with what came out of either Chairman Bernanke or Chair Yellen's mouth. Uh, the new Fed whisperer at the Wall Street Journal, Nick Timoreos, uh, he's been less bankable, putting out a dovish signal and sparking a rally several weeks ago, and then walking it back on Sunday. It's unclear how much of what he writes is actually his own opinion or what he's receiving directly from Powell. The market assumes he's receiving this directly from Powell, but it's not clear anymore. And um, uh, But thus, thus far, he does not have the reliability we had from his pre- predecessor, Hilsenrath. Either his access is very limited and he's trying to represent that he is the Fed whisperer and he's not, or the messages he's receiving are convoluted. But there is a clear communication breakdown, and, and uh, his, his notes have not been helpful. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to read all of these notes, but basically you can see the dates, October 13th, October 21st, October 30th is when he walked it back, and the latest note from last night. And it, it's, it's insane that this is the market activity on the basis of articles. Nothing to do with earnings, nothing to do with fundamentals, nothing to do with underlying inflation, uh, just articles from the quote-unquote Fed whisperer. Spark the rally, follow through rally, walk it back, uh, blow the door open. So um, the cherry on top of the Sunday of mixed messaging came on Wednesday when the Federal Reserve released a very dovish official statement noted by the green underlined below, which caused markets to rally 1%, only to be reversed and destroyed by Chair Powell's contradict- contradictory double talk press conference, uh, closing the S&P down 2.51%. This is what they said in the press release, quote, in determining the pace of future increases in the target range, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. All of these are good. 
Um, then how can you go from that official statement to quote, it's premature for any pause is beyond me. The definition of quote, taking into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, i.e. they've done 400 basis points in eight months, a record amount on a percentage basis, plus quantitative tightening and the lags which monetary policy affects the economy and inflation. Uh, the definition of that is to pause and see the impact over a few months before doing more. Depending on what the markets do today, I would guess we'll see another article from the quote Fed whisperer and or a parade of Fed speakers in coming days to cl quote clarify what they meant based on market action because what was written and what was said are two different stories. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had a little bit of that today. Um, the market was uh, careening in the morning and then we had this guy Barker come out and say, Bailey rather, says nobody should read 75 basis points as the new norm for rate hikes. So they tried to reemphasize the 50 and uh, and that's uh, a pivot of sorts because they're they're slowing down the pace of tightening um, or pause-ish, whatever you want to call it. So um, the only positive takeaway was a signaled reduction to 50 basis points in December or the next meeting afterward. Unfortunately, as of this meeting, as of this morning, futures are now assigning only a 47.2% chance that the December hike will be only 50 basis points. That is down from 58.9% just a week ago, shortly after Timoros uh, suggested that 50 basis points was the plan. As I said in the interview above, quote, the first move in this case down is usually the wrong one following a Fed meeting. Give it 24 hours to digest and we'll see how it develops. Uh, here are my show notes ahead of the segment that we did not have time to cover due to the Powell presser. Uh, as far as earnings go, they're okay. 71% beat on the, t on the bottom line, 68 on the top line so far with uh, more than half having reported. Earnings growth is about 2.2% versus 28 So less than expected. If you take out energy, earnings are negative year on year. So the Fed is achieving its objective to destroy demand. The forward PE is 16.3, which is why I think uh, he's been fighting the headwind of fiscal spending. I think if the uh, statistics are correct in the Republican sweep, uh, I think he's going to find that that headwind subsides and they've already tightened too much uh, and they'll have to backtrack sooner rather than later. Um, estimates um, are 0.5% uh, growth for Q Q4 and plus 6% for 2023. Communication service is the largest year-on-year -year earnings de decline was the Albatross with Al Alphabet and Meta down 19% year-on-year. Excluding Alphabet and Meta uh, earnings for communication sector, uh, services sector would have been negative 2.3. The bottom-up 12-month price target for the S&P is 45.28, which is 17% higher. Uh, communication services is expected to see the largest price increase over the next 12 months as this sector has the largest upside differences between the bottom up target price and the closing price so everyone's chasing energy except energy i'll just go here now is going to have the worst earnings growth next year off of a high base whereas communication uh, i'm sorry consumer discretionary is going to have the highest earnings growth uh, 35.5% next year off of a low base. And no one wants to touch consumer discretionary and everyone's chasing energy at the exact wrong time. So, uh, so you've got communication services with the highest, lar largest uh, price target increase, consumer discretionary with the largest earnings increase. Neither of these groups you can give away. I think there are bargains in both that, that can be, start to be looked at because remember, the market bottoms well before earnings even start to peak out in some cases. Um, and this set, sets the stage for some strength into year end as the Fed slows down, followed by sideways up by its churn until earnings start to recover mid-2023. Sector and stock selection will be key. And that's why we're trying to break some of that down here. Uh, this was my Fed thoughts before the meeting, 75 bips on Wednesday. The two-year yield already implied 150 basis points more was already priced in. So we did 75 of that. Maybe we do 50, 25, and we're done. Um, I also talked about how GDP at plus 2.6, I think it was 2.7%, was a one-off due to exports primarily. 
notably petroleum and and energy products. That's a one-off. If you back out the net exports of energy, et cetera, you actually had negative GDP for the third quarter in a row. Uh, jolts came in hot, so we're not expecting miracles for the non-farm payrolls report tomorrow. They're expecting 200,000 jobs. Uh, if we got much lower, that would be a surprise. That would be a very welcome surprise, but it's unlikely given the jolts, although the continuing claims were elevated, so uh, you never know. But the key is the Fed needs something to hang their hat on, and um, tomorrow likely won't be it, but uh, um, we'll see. The election may be it, though if, uh, if fiscal spending gets shut off, uh, they will have a different framework from which to analyze um what to do moving forward uh okay so we covered this um majority of uh, fund manager survey participants expect the tightening cycle to end in q1 of 2023 that's one quarter faster than a, a month ago the survey in september um investors are now three sigma underweight equ equities surpassing even the panic during the great financial trough in 2009 uh, managers are crowded into cash and out of equities these conditions are present at every capitulation low and long us dollar is the most crowded trade as you go back through all the previous crowded trades you'll see that did not end well uh, we covered the election uh, here's the money supply growth this is um, m2 change uh, m2 money supply change year on year shifted uh leading by 16 months so you can see cpi rolls over every time m2 starts to roll over and we covered that in the previous chart uh five-year inflation break even remain anchored at 265 down from 359 uh buyback windows now opening with earnings over you're going to see about five billion dollars a day in buybacks from now through the end of the year they're going to get ahead of that january 1st uh buyback tax of one percent uh and then the key idea was um for 2023 whether the fed does 50 or 75 in december the key is we're approaching the end in tightening likely q1 the biggest impacts are number one bonds will get bid and number two the dollar will stop going up emerging markets which is 37 percent china uh, now trading at 2007 prices historically trade opposite the us dollar when the dollar is strong black line below as it has been rising since spring of last year emerging emerging markets have sold off 40 percent dollar strong emerging markets weak etc 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 so um when the dollar stops going up as it did in 2002 2009 2016 2020 you'll see a monster rally in emerging markets and china just as we saw from 2002 to 2007 a 480 percent rally see this Emerging markets were in the crapper. Dollar weakened. Emerging markets went up 480%. Uh, some Chinese stocks were up 20x over that period. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, dollar stops going up, rolls over. Emerging markets up 189% over the next year and a half. That means some stocks were up 5 and 10x. Uh, 2016 to 2018, same thing. Dollar stops going up, starts to weaken just enough. It, it kind of went sideways. But you still had enough to have a 100% rally over the next two years during a tightening cycle, by the way. Uh, and uh, 2020 to 2021, dollar stops going up. You have a 100% rally uh, in, in a year. So uh, we think the next, same thing is coming uh, to a theater near you. We just don't know exactly when by the day. But we look at how the commercials are positioned. And when they get positioned like that, uh, every single time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sooner or later, they're right. Dollar rolls over. Emerging markets will rip. Uh, same thing with bonds. They're uh, While they're short the dollar, the green line here, they are long bonds. That's why I agree with Gunlac. Uh, I think it's time to buy long bonds. I think that's an opportunity. Uh, and you could bet against them, but um, you know, it didn't serve you well the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten out of ten times. So, um, and then lastly, as I always say, managers aren't positioned for any white swans, i.e. a sweep would mean no more spending. Interest rates could start to fall to sniff that out. Dollar stabilizing, massive buybacks before the end of the year. Uh, the $700 billion stimulus being actually pulled back, uh, potentially, or, or challenged. 
uh, supply chain improving, freight rates dropping. We're seeing the supply chain just in uh, Cooper Standard and, and uh, all the companies that we deal with. Collapsing prices, commodities, gas, rents, used cars. Used cars are plummeting. Uh, that's a big component of CPI. Political gridlock after November 8th is bullish. People aren't really focused on that just yet. Uh, and millennial housing and family formation wave just beginning. We think that's uh, eight to 10 years of secular demand. Um, hikes less than 150 basis points more, maybe 50, 25. Uh, that would probably that would get you to 150. But we'll see if the if the Fed gets something to hang hang their hat on in the meantime. Or you could potentially get a ceasefire in Russia Ukraine. In their press release, a big portion of their complaint was the war in Russia Ukraine causing all these price spikes. Um, here, second second major uh, line paragraph, Russia's war against U Ukraine is causing tremendous human and economic hardship. The war and related events are creating additional upward pressure on inflation and are weighing on economic global activity. The committee is highly attentive to inflation risk. So if this if this major component went away that they're blaming for inflation, uh, they would have nothing to substantiate continuing to hike rates. Uh, and there's a lot of chatter that something may may potentially be imminent. We don't know. I mean, I, I think the colder it gets in Europe, the higher the probability. But um, uh, apparently Zelensky was doing some remote thing to Yale University. And he said he think anyway, these are all rumors. We don't know until we know. Just like we don't, you know, until the dollar weakens, nothing we say about Alibaba matters until the press release comes out and uh, Cooper standards refinance. The improving fundamentals don't matter either. Uh, but once they do, it's binary and it's massive. So, so that's that. Getting right back to this um, auto supplier update. So um, basically, the outcome was better than expected from an operating standpoint. They increased revenue 24.8% compared to the third quarter. I got a lot of feedback about the CEO sounded um, frustrated or angry or like he wanted to take his ball and go home. Uh, that I think that's the wrong way to think about it. What What the CEO was actually doing on that call was negotiating with suppliers and negotiating with lenders, two of which things are his highest priority at the moment. So you saw this statement where he said, we're not going to give away parts for free in Europe. If they don't pay us for the, the parts, uh, we're, we're going to just shut it down. It's a non-profitable business anyway. It's not contributing anything to EBITDA. So they're basically saying, uh, give us more profits or we're going to shut down a losing business, which shareholders would want to hear anyway. And, and that's a positive thing. But it puts the additional uh, pressure on the Stellantis of the world who just reported great numbers to say, all right, give them a little money. Because if they shut down, the number two and three people behind them are very weak and wobbly and can't actually meet our demand. So they would have hundreds of thousands of cars sitting there with no parts to go in them. And, uh, you know, not many people are going to want to buy cars without cooling systems fuel delivery systems and or sealing around the windshield, door windows, etc. cetera, uh, particularly if you are sensitive to rain coming through and, uh, you know, raining on your head while you're driving. So, um, um, you know, it's one thing not to have heat in your home uh, based on no natural gas supplies, but not to have it in your car would, would be, uh, you know, duly troubling uh, for this winter. So uh, anyway, um, so look, revenues were up 24.8, even though the volumes, you know, he made a point that the volumes they saw were were le less than he had anticipated, but yet he was still able to turn lemons into lemonade, grow the revenues by 24.8% year on year, uh, grow EBITDA from negative 10 million last quarter to positive 20 million this quarter, um, and, and gain a meaningful amount of new Business awards, um, uh, 27 million on electric vehicles and 72 million. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, I didn't know this, but first and foremost, I, I did know they make 20% more on EVs than they do on ICE cars. Uh, but the bigger thing is that um, they... In their, in their deck, when they list all the companies that are their customers, obviously Ford and GM are their biggest, 
but Tesla is a big customer. And the reason they don't list Tesla is because Tesla asked them not to use their logo in promotional materials. So obviously you don't want to piss off your customer. Uh, so they took that out. But I thought that they had all these EV platforms except for the one that was most important, but they've been doing business with Tesla for years. So that's really good because Tesla is obviously hockey sticking around the world as well. So all of these things are positive. Um, what's not positive is, you know, they had to make the um, continued declaration uh, about the refinancing. And as a matter of fact, uh, let's see here. Uh, Rich C asked a really good question. Appreciate your analysis on CPS. I noticed in their Q3 press release today, the following comment, quote, the company's ability to meet its debt service requirements for the next 12 months is contingent upon its ability to refinance its term loan facility. Uh, combining this default under, uh, let's see, combining this with their prior disclosures that a going concern opinion from their auditors would trigger a default under all their debt arrangements essentially requires them to get some sort of refinancing in place prior to February or March of 2023, the normal time frame for their auditors to issue the report. Practically speaking, they will need to have some sort of definitive arrangement by January 2023. Otherwise, it will be too tight to avoid a mess with their other lenders. Essentially only three months. Given the strength of their brand and positive operational momentum, it seems highly likely they will be able to refinance their debt uh, but at what cost, given the credit markets are very tight? In your experience, what is the likely dilutive effect of a refi in this credit environment, i.e. warrants, etc.? Um, well, they've basically, all they have to do is push out the three, the uh, $300 million November 2023 term loan. Um, that, if I remember correctly, is a group of CLOs um, and that, that's not the type of lender that wants to take over a business. So they don't want to play too much hardball. However, money has become more costly. So I think that money is at, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it was like LIBOR plus 375. So, uh, call it whatever it is. My guess is that would go to plus, um, you know, maybe like SOFR plus, 700 basis points or something like that. So it would go up. Um, more likely than not, I think what would be the most likely outcome if Goldman is doing their job is uh, a partial pay down where they pay down maybe, you know, 50 or 80 million of that, maybe 100 million, maybe less, some fee to get the extension and they push it from November all they really have to do is push it to January 1st of 2023 and then they avoid the going concern. Uh, but my, my guess is they push it six or 12 months out. And if we look at what they've been doing from negative 10 million last quarter to 20 million this quarter to guidance of 35 to 40 million of adjusted EBITDA next quarter, you know, you go into lenders next year with the Fed stopped hiking and 50 million a quarter of EBITDA uh, it's going to be a friendly, very friendly conversation, and then they can refinance the whole thing uh, sometime next year. So I do think that they'll get something done. I think Goldman's bankers are incentivized to get it done before December 31st, because like all good bankers, they want their bonus in February of 2023, not February of 2024. So, um, so we're sanguine, but there are no guarantees. And we knew that with eyes open go go coming in, that's part of the catalyst and that's part of the risk reward i'm surprised how quickly they were able to turn around operating performance i i was expecting more likely positive 10 million of ebitda and then they were going to say uh we're still you know trim their guidance and say but we'll have 40 million next quarter and then next quarter they come in at 20 uh and that would have not been a good situation but they came in much higher than expected this quarter so it makes the 35 realistic 35 or 40 realistic for next quarter uh, and that puts them in a good position so i think the timing i think they're going to thread the needle on this but you know obviously there are no guarantees and all the things that rich c mentions are accurate and known since day one and discussed since day one so um so we'll see how yeah, how it shakes out over the next couple of months but i think this was a good quarter and i think that uh not only 
was the CEO presenting strength to its customers uh, to get better deals. It was also presenting strength to its lenders, uh, basically saying all options are on the table. Because last thing you want if you're the CLO manager is to go through a bankruptcy restructuring and your, your money's tied up for two years and you have uncertainty of outcome and you're not senior uh you uh senior secured well it's unclear so um uh they they don't want that outcome so but at the same time the company doesn't want to pay you know 15 percent either so they have to come to something where they play a little bit of chicken up to the last minute uh to get the best deal for the company and to get the best deal the lenders want to get the best deal for themselves and uh, avoid the worst case outcome. And I I think that's where it is on the consumer side and on the lender side, and it's just part of the process. And the equity investors that listened to the conference call thought that, you know, the CEO was just, uh, uh, you know, being pessimistic, but really he was there to um, uh, push a strong message to the two constituents that he needs to uh, resolve in a positive way in a short period of time. And I think he's doing a good job of it as evidenced by uh, the impact of the previously negotiated contracts that yielded this type of operating result uh, in the most recent quarter. So kudos to them on the field. Uh, While everyone's, you know, criticizing from the stands, they're on the field getting the job done. And, um, and, and, and as far as your question about warrants and dilution and all that stuff that would be the natural assumption uh, that it would be some type of hairy instrument from some hedge fund uh um worst case scenario but um i i think that rather than fulfilling their ambitions of taking out the 2023 and 2024 paper all at once in the worst possible environment when they're in the weakest position I think they they should do everything they can to just push out that 2023 paper, pay a fee, pay a little bit more money, uh, get get rid of the going concern issue, uh, and then just keep ramping up their operating because the volumes are going to continue to grow. Uh, and then you know midway through next year when they're doing 50 plus million of EBITDA per quarter, and um, uh, and the Fed is done with their tightening and credit markets have have relieved a little bit and bonds have been bid and spreads compress, uh, then they could take out take out both uh, both pieces of paper at advantageous prices uh, and and really see and then the focus goes goes right back to the fundamentals, which are uh, better than I expected they would be. Uh, but uh, the point I said here is uh, uh, why did the stock sell off? No news on the refinancing front other than they were still in discussions with lenders and Goldman Sachs was their advisor. There will be no news updates until it's done. And Okay, so we covered that. Uh, just as I said, the upside spike in the stock last quarter was meaningless until they get the refinancing done. So is the downside spike this quarter, although I think today it's up 10% or something like that, um, which is also meaningless. When when the refinancing is announced, then and only then will the focus shift to the improving fundamentals and be credited by the market. Uh, and I also put this chart here just to show how this is exactly how it bottomed the last time and it's doing the same thing. So we should expect a lot more volatility before we finally get some resolution uh, and then go from there. So uh, sentiment is now neutral on the AAII, neutral on the fear and greed index, which means people are just generally confused. And the Fed did a good job of um, um, helping them out on that front uh, and continuing the confusion yesterday. This is the Russell small cap top 30 weights. We covered that chart that shows that they should start to outperform. Well, their cumulative earnings power of the top 30 stocks increased by 4.56% in the last 60 days. And for next year, those uh, earnings of the top 30 uh, weights increased by 3.16%. So while everyone's doom and gloom, small caps earnings estimates are going up, not down. Up, up, up. NASDAQ, everyone, the end of the world, NASDAQ's down. 30% and uh, their earnings were down 3% in the last 60 days. 3.4% for next year, 2.3% for this year. So so that's that. Again, separating emotion from the facts is critical uh, if you're going to make a lot of money in this business over time. So uh, some economic data, you know, you know, the Fed is succeeding. Chicago PMI was down. 
Um, manufacturing PMI was better than expected. Construction spending better than expected. ISM manufacturing employment was worse than expected. Uh, prices, ISM manufacturing prices came in lower than expected. That's good. Uh, manufacturing PMI barely in expansion, 50.2, expected 50.0. Uh, we had a draw on the API. We had a draw in crude inventories this week. Uh, car sales better than uh, last print. Truck sales much better than last print by over a million. Um, so that's it. This was continuing claims. They've been stubbornly higher. They expected 1.45. They got... 1.485 so maybe that's a sign that um uh we'll start to see some weakness i don't think we're going to see it tomorrow they're expecting 200,000 non-farm payrolls gosh if we got an, a, a weak number it, it's just not showing that it will happen just yet based on the jolts report and other things that we look at but if we did get like a hundred thousand boy the market would take off uh but i'm not holding my breath on that i think it's going to take some time and uh, what I'll be looking at is average hourly earnings, which have been coming down. So uh, we'll see if that trend continues. And with that, uh, we're going to sign. Oh, um, this is just what I wanted to show you about next year's earnings expectations. Uh, the last shall be first. Energy was the top. Everyone's chasing it at the wrong time. It's going to be the worst next year. And consumer discretionary, which no one wants to touch with a 10 foot pole, same with industrials, financials and consumer services, they're all gonna outperform in terms of earnings growth. So you wanna potentially start to look at bargains in those spaces. So with that said, I wanna thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.